Hello and welcome to the first edition of the second season of the Fingalscape podcast. We start the new year with another wonderful guest, who is a musician, composer and one of the most versatile artists we had on the show so far. He has been a crucial part on every single Roger Waters tour between 2002 and 2016 and if his last name is familiar, that's because he is also the son of Roger Waters. Welcome, Harry Waters. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Thank you. So how are you today? Everything's good? It's good. It's a bit cold. You know, it's winter, so it's uh, Christmas yeah. is coming. It's getting a bit colder, which I hate. Uh, I love the heat, but um, but it's it's good. Yeah, all, all is good. I've been practicing today. Um, I've been learning some jazz, which is a bit cheating, really, because, you know, I'm not don't really play jazz professionally that much so if I have a bit a few spare minutes sometimes I'll uh, practice some jazz so I've just been learning Inner Urge by Joe Henderson which is really difficult difficult tune but so everything's good great I, so know I think well. we're going to talk about jazz yeah. later on because I yeah, know sure. that we have two jazz fans in the podcast right now so yeah. <laughs> I'll lean yeah. back and you talk about jazz I'm happy <laughs> yeah so but um First things first, um, it's, it's a question we ask every interview in this podcast as a first question, but in your case, I think it's very, uh, I'm really curious to know. So the question is, would you still consider yourself a Pink Floyd fan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I grew up on the music, uh, I listened to it a lot as a kid, I listened to The Wall a lot as a kid, uh, I didn't listen to all the other albums until, you know, a bit, until my teens, really. Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I never, I never put it on anymore. You know, let, let's, let's, let's put it like that. I've heard it so many times. I would never, ever put it on just for my listening pleasure. But I still really enjoy what, you know, I enjoy playing it. And, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's great. great. I grew up on that I love it. Yeah. So, so did you did you ever also listen to unofficial recordings or old shows from the early seventies or seventy uh, seven? Not, not really. You know, not not really. It's uh, it's not a big thing in England like the sort of bootleg scene. You know, it was uh, that was really an, an American thing. Grateful Dead and those types of bands have got thousands, tens of thousands of bootlegs of all their shows and everything. Um, I, I'm sure there are ones that exist of Pink Floyd, but no, not really. It was not a thing in England. No one had bootlegs or circulated bootlegs or anything. Um, so w one or two, but n not really, no. Okay. Phil? So, yeah, yeah. T talking about your childhood, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the, I'm the father of a one and a half year old daughter, and I often find myself wondering, you know, what things I play uh, around the house or what things I work on around the house that will stick yeah. with her for many years. You know, do you, what, was, was your house a very musical one in the sense that was, was music happening all the time? And, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, d dad had a studio there, so he, he used to work in that daily. So he was often in there working, but you couldn't, it was soundproof. So you couldn't hear it from in the house. Uh, but I used to go in there a lot and listen to recording and playing and stuff like that. But in the house, now I was pretty much responsible for putting all, you know, most of the music on. Uh, my mum had a really good vinyl collection, uh, which I kind of discovered when I was about seven. Um, and then I used to copy, you know, back in the old days, I'm sure you guys remember, you, you, you had to copy your vinyl onto a cassette if you wanted to take it away with you, you know. So, so I would copy these vinyls and my mum's vinyls and then take them to school on, on tape, you know. And listen to them in school so so it was always it was me playing like uh, allman brothers and buddy holly and little richard and the beatles and elvis and king crimson and yes and that kind of thing neil young and you know many many older music you know music from the 50s 60s and 70s oh that sounds That's great, great. Uh, I think yeah. that that album live at Fillmore East. I'm guessing that might have been one you played yeah. too. That's that's, that's I, just I love, fabulous. I mean, I love that record. Yeah, it's incredible. The Allman Brothers was such a big deal for me when I was like eight or nine. You know, I just absolutely loved them. You know. I when you mentioned taping albums on the cassette, I still have a memory. I think it was about the same age as you just mentioned, about nine years old, where I taped a copy of The yeah. Doors' Greatest Hits. 
uh, and would bring it with me to school. And I still remember yeah. in the middle of taping, I turned it up and uh, without realizing that the way I was taping would also turn the volume on the cassette up. Yeah, yeah. So, so every time Robbie Krieger hits one particular note, I expect it to suddenly get louder. I'm still surprised yeah, when yeah. it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So I was listening to one of your, I believe it was Pompadour on the website. And, oh, okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I found myself, um, you know, there are sort of a few lines intersecting. I've been at a very late age, because uh, I think a lot of people get into them earlier. I've been listening to the band a lot more lately. And I found myself thinking of Garth Hudson in particular, yeah. some of the organ player. I was wondering yeah. whether that was an influence. Yeah, look, I've actually got, look, and this isn't planned at all, but when I was, uh, if you look in the top there, these, these are some oh. of my, like, when I was learning draw bar settings. Uh, oh, no kidding. My, <laughs> that's my, to play like Garth Hudson draw bar settings. Uh, and then I've got, I've got my book of tea, uh you know oh, wow uh, green onions yeah yeah exactly to play green onions and that's actually jimmy smith as well if you want to play mm -hmm. like jimmy smith you do the first four bars out full and then none of the others and then you put the uh chorus on and it's for it's vibrato three i think and then you put percussion on and you put soft on uh but anyway so there you go yeah yeah absolutely i mean i love the band i absolutely love them in fact, I was having a conversation the other day about, we were talking about Richie Hayward and Levon Helm, who are two of my favourite drummers. Richie Hayward was in Little Feet, and they're another one of my favourite favorite bands. But yeah, absolutely, I love love the band. Big Pink is one of my favourites, and, you know, yeah, they're great. Yeah, I definitely thought I could hear a connection in Pompadour. It's just something, I, I don't I don't know if I would have picked it up had I not been so saturated lately in their music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Larry, Larry, who's my other half, you know, of that, he's the other half of that band. We're both huge, the band fans, you know? Um, so, yeah, I guess, I guess that comes through, you know? Definitely, yeah. If I could ask about another um, organ player, uh, one I think our listeners will be, uh, certainly familiar with, although I hope most of them are familiar with Garth, Garth Hudson. Um, I was wondering, I know that you probably didn't see a lot of Rick Wright um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a boy, but I was wondering, you know, first of all, did you ever meet him? Did you, uh, Richard Wright? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, grow, growing up, I hung out a lot with Dave's kids, uh, with David's kids, and Gala was a little bit older than, than us, and that's obviously a bigger age gap when you're a kid. You know, a few years is like all the difference. Gala's like, I don't know, four or five years older than me, maybe. But yeah, sure. I, I, I sort of remember him a little bit, you know, and we hung out with Steve O'Rourke's kids and Nick's kids as well. Um, so yes, but yes, but no. I, I you know, I don't ever remember hanging out. I certainly didn't, you know, like, pick his brains and sit down at the piano with him. I, I was too young. I was like five or, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah, don't, don't really remember him, you know, personally. I mean, in a very real way, it seems to me like you've gotten to know him in a different way because you've lived inside yeah. some of those keyboard parts. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think in my own work, I've been thinking a lot about what a quirky, um, sense of harmony and an unusual i mean the chord changes in something like great kick in the sky are so i mean i've never seen anything else like them you know in any mm. in any other rock music really yeah it's not yeah. it's not so much that they're unusual it's that they're unusual in this very quirky way that i can't i can't really pigeonhole yeah way. yeah you know it's just it moves in force pretty much the whole way throughout there's only a couple of chords that aren't moving in force you know it's very sort of d diatonic it's just um yeah, I know. I know what you mean. I, I know what you mean. You could sort of dive into the theory, but there's nothing unusual going on there. There's nothing like weird or sort of um, harmonically strange. It's very basic stuff, but so effective, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you know his um his solo album Wet Dream at all? Have you ever heard that one? No, I don't know it. I, I know the name, but mm -hmm. you know. Um, but no, I don't. I don't know. It's it's pretty divisive uh, among fans. I I really like it. Um, and I think one yeah. thing is it really, um, he has a few songs in there. One in particular called Holiday, where he really stretches his legs in the same way that he does in Great Gig in the Sky and, and oh, songs okay, like that. Cool. Yeah, it's got some really cool chord changes. It's worth it's worth okay, the spin for sure. Nice. Yeah. So. Another question that came to mind: You've, you've played with uh, you know Pink Floyd's music with a bunch of different drummers. And mm. so people, when they talk about Nick Mason, they often talk about his lazy eights on songs like Echoes, you know, the way he plays a little bit behind the beat. 
the and, days behind the beat, yeah. Yeah, and I wondered, I wondered if you could speak to that experience of, of playing that music with different drummers and how that changes your approach and whether you're thinking consciously about playing yeah, relative to the beat. It, do, it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't change... No, it doesn't really change my, my approach. You know, the drummer's there to keep time for the most part. Um, and I've only I've played with Nick a handful of times when he comes and guests with us. So I'm still at that stage, primarily listening to Graham, who was always the drummer in Dad's band, Graham Broad, when I was in it. So I so I probably I don't even really recall whether I had Nick very loud in my cans or not. You know, um, they're just for sort of kind of novel, novelty's sake. I haven't played enough with him to really know, but I've played a lot of music with a lot of different drummers and some are very pushy uh, and some are very behind the beat, you know. Uh, a couple of years ago, I just joined a band, uh, NHC, which was Taylor Hawkins' uh, offshoot side project from the Foo Fighters uh, with um, Dave Navarro and Chris Chaney, who are the guitar player and, and bass player. And we were making a record We'd recorded two songs and he'd asked me to join the band uh, and then he died. So that was just heart heartbreaking. But he was he's a very pushy drummer. You know, he's very much pushing and ahead of the beat. And then you've got someone like John Bonham, who's so behind the beat. You know, his snare just falls really, really late, you know, and bo both are great. Uh, they're, they're different. They, they do make you play differently if you've got a big drummer that's really driving the music, you know, Um trying to think which i which i prefer I, li I like both i don't think i have a preference you know um as long as the bass player isn't like it as long as the bass player uh, with jazz as long as the bass player is pushing then then that's good you know um then it allows the piano player or the the, the horn player or the guitar player to to lay back and really swing um but yeah dr I, I i like both in drums I like I like behind and ahead, but you can't have a bass player playing behind. That's that's the worst. I don't. Like <laughs> when I was when I was younger, I listened to old recordings of myself, and I I pushed to the point of rushing. <laughs> I listened to what some old recordings. What instrument do you play? Both bass. Well, it's complicated. I I started out as a trumpet player, and then I switched to bass when I hit college and played bass. And but in in my role as a teacher, I play a lot of piano, so I'm sort of pivoting between okay. all three depending on, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a terrible piano player, but I, but I can do interest. I, I like to joke. I can do with two hands, what a good piano player can do with one. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so it's kind of like that Ravel piano concerto. Um, um, another thing I wondered too, is you've had the experience both live in the studio playing with, with a click track versus playing with a, you know, a live drummer. And I wonder how that changes your approach too. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I've just done, 57 shows with Les Claypool. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but we're going to talk about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, but uh, no click, you know. And I'm so used to playing with click. You know, Dad's band always plays with click, always. You have to because there's all the visuals and there's so much going on. And you have stuff on tape, you know, there's uh, strings on tape. And, you know, so you just, everything has to be to click. And it's, um, it, I, for the most part, just don't even have the click, don't have it on. Because I listen to the drummer. If the drummer's got click, you don't, I don't need to listen to the click. You know, I just don't need to have it. I only need to have it if I'm starting a song, like great gig or whatever. Obviously, if you're going to start the song, you need the click. So it's fine. I've spent so much of my practice time playing to a metronome. So it's totally fine. I, I've never had any problems playing to a click. I'm totally comfortable. It doesn't some people it freaks them out. I, I guess if you haven't practiced with a click, then it's hard, you know. But if you can't play to a click, you can't play in time. You know, you you when you're playing to a click, you can only play in time. If it doesn't sound good, it's because you're playing out of time. But you can turn the click off and think your timing is is fantastic. But unless you do it to click, you your time you, you won't know that your timing is 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 spot on, you know. Um but yeah, I prefer playing without. It's sort of more fun, I guess, in in some ways. But but it's fine. I have no problem playing with a click. You know, I'm so I'm so used to it. Perfectly happy playing with a click. I find that yeah. a lot of players who move between jazz and, and rock music and classical music, as as I guess we both have done, I think yeah. depending on where you start out, they they do have sort of different conceptions of time once you get into actually being on stage. And I, I sometimes joke with my students that you know. 
if you want to really go all in with the macho ideal of timekeeping, you know, you should be able to finish your solo, then go across the street, you know, and get a drink and come back while the drum is the drum the drummer is finishing their solo and then know exactly where you are. Right. In other words, yeah. there's this sort of idea that we should have this click track going, you know, all the time. And it's yeah. so different in, in classical music and in string quartets, you know, breathe together. Uh, totally. you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, you know, time is so much more fluid in classical music you know, than it is in rock music or, or jazz music. Um, it's up to the conductor. He can do what he wants, you know. Um, but um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, there's one thing I really don't like, and it's it's really weird. I just did some gigs with uh, Brett Floyd, which were which was, it was fantastic. Lovely guys and great players. And they've got a click, so that's fine. But they've taken the clicks. They've copied them exactly from the records. So when I, when I, and I play great gig with them. When I play great gig, the click speeds up. Because, you know, when they recorded it in whenever 1970, I don't know, when was Dark Side of the Moon, 74? It was recorded in 72, was. yeah, released in 73. Okay, there you go, in 72. They didn't do it to click. So Rick's playing and he speeds up, like really speeds up, like, I don't know how many, but like three, four, five BPM maybe. But, you know, and I'm not talking about when they go to the loud bit, when everyone comes in and Claire Torrey starts. I mean, he's speeding up from like bar two or three it's you know it's so you're it's always just, in a hustle yeah um, yeah totally yeah. So just, you know and i had no I, I didn't know this until i got there and we we did a sound check and i tested it i thought oh my god what is this and i asked them afterward i mean i knew what was going on obviously they'd obviously match the click from the album but that's weird i would never do, i would never do that you know uh but that's their choice and that's fine um, but that, that's unusual. That's like weirdly uncomfortable, you know, in no click or a click that stays the same. I think I think maybe dad used to do that at points. I do remember Gr Graham, you know, writing variable clicks at some point, but I, I don't know if we ever played them or whether it, whether that idea was scrapped, but I don't like that at all. Mm, uh, you already uh, mentioned Graham Broad um, sometimes now, and I would love to talk with you about the... Uh the tours you did between 2002 and 2016. Um, funny enough, if we uh, once we talked before, beforehand to this podcast, uh, I told Phil that these are the tours I like most, and uh, it might be co incidental or even not. But I saw you, I saw you live for many times between 2002 to 2016, and um, I just have a few questions um, yeah. from a fan perspective, so to speak. Yeah, First sure. of all, in, in 2006, um, there were rumors that you tried to work with the uh, v, uh, v, VCS3 machine uh, during On The Run. Is that true? Did you try to get yeah, any I had, I sound had out of on, it? Um, on stage, maybe it was the VCS3. I think I actually had one on stage. I'm just trying to remember. I definitely had something. Yeah, just for On The Run. Yeah. Yeah. Was it an EMS synthy by any chance or? Shit, could have been. Let okay. me look at a picture. Uh, <laughs> let me just Google it, VCS3, and then and then tell me the name VCS3. Uh, I, it could have been a VCS3. Yeah, I know what that looks like. What, what was the other one you said, EMS? Uh, EMS, I think it's pronounced synthy. It's synth with an I synthy. on the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, No, it was more likely to be a VCS3. It def no, definitely not an EMS synthy. It could have actually been a VCS3. It could have been a VCS3. It was something very similar to that, if not exactly that one. You okay, know, so it was uh, actually plugged in and you, you tried to get some noise out of it? Yeah, yeah. Great, great. Yeah, yeah. But we didn't do it. I, I, I don't remember doing it often. I can't, I can't, I don't remember doing it much, but it was definitely there on stage and I used to turn around and fiddle around. Oh, great. It, you know? Yeah. And I would love to uh, talk with you about uh, Coachella, the uh, two shows you, mm. you did there in, in 2016. Yeah. And mm. um, to me personally, as I would say to many Roger Waters and Pink Floyd fans, the uh, first show is somehow the pinnacle of of Roger Waters life. I don't know how really to describe it, but the set list was 
just wonderful, at least for Pink Floyd fans. Even I missed some uh, of Roger's solo stuff, but the set list was wonderful. The play, the show, everything was great. Dogs and pigs and everything. And the whole vibe of that show is very lean back. Roger was in a good mood. At least it seems like that. Um, how, how did you experience the Coachella uh, shows was it for you something special or was is it just my f fan thing <laughs> no i mean it was great it was amazing you know it, there was a lot of good material in there we played pigs for the first time we'd never played pigs before uh so that was really good fun um yeah it was great it was really good you know playing a bunch of animals i love animals that's my yeah. favorite to play um and it was great to see all the other see all the other bands you know watch neil young twice I watched Paul McCartney twice. I watched a bit of The Stones. I watched The Who um, and Bob Dylan a bit. It was, yeah, it was really good fun. Yeah, And it was, a, I, I think fun. it was also Graham Broad's last uh, yeah. two shows yeah. he did. And yeah. I, I, he's, he's been there since 80, 87, I would say. And I always loved his style, his very tight yeah. style of drumming. And yeah, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a total change now to Joey Waronka, who's doing it uh, since. He's a totally yeah. different drummer. And it's um, yeah. the funny thing is that that um, I would say that Joey is even more like Nick Mason, a little bit yeah. behind, I would say. Yeah. But um, funny as it is, um, I personally liked Graham's style much more because it was, um, for me, more Pink Floydish in the end. Yeah. Um, but it's funny how much it changed the whole musical style of the shows. Yeah. Only changing the yeah. drama. I know he changed many yeah. members, but the drama for me is one of the most specific things I realized there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, he's but, great. Uh, I love Graham. He's, he's great. Yeah. yeah. I think another thing. That yeah, a but, lot of but good to were... know that you also uh, like Coachella so much because it is, yeah. to me personally, the pinnacle of, of Roger Waters yeah. playing Pink yeah, Flight Live. Right. And. You were yeah. a part of that, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're welcome. I think "Fearless" is a song that that was where it got its debut, right? I think was that heard for the first yeah, time. Yeah, I'm not sure we'd ever done "Fearless" before. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. Never. That's because a song that means after. a lot to a, a lot of people. Yeah. 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 Great yeah. song. Yeah. Yeah. On your website, you mentioned some of the classical pianists who have influenced you: uh, Ashkenazi, mm -hmm. Horowitz, Ruben, Rubinstein. I'm wondering if you could just speak yeah. to what what is special to you about each of them and 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 uh yeah why them in particular uh, yeah good good question i um they're just the ones i sort of listen to the most you know um i i've got into classical music a lot more in my adult life in the last 10 15 years i didn't i, ne I was never classically trained and i didn't really listen to any classical music um d deliberately until 10 or 15 years ago I always liked scores, film scores and stuff, but it was not something I dove into. So I never learned classical music. So it's something that I've really enjoyed getting into in the last 10 or 15 years. So I don't know that those guys really uh, anywhere near as well as I know the jazz guys who I've been studying for like nearly 30 years now. So I don't know. I, I, I can't sort of talk about their playing in quite the same context as I can the jazz guys. I just know that I, I've listened to all the Chopin recordings and, um, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms and Vivaldi. And I mean, I particularly like solo classical piano, you know, and I just, those three are the ones that I sort of have gravitated uh, towards, you know, but I love Christoph Eschenbach as well, like his um, uh, A vous de maman, which is the like twinkle variations. I love playing that, and he's my favorite recording of that. But I love Daniel Barenboim as well, and you know, there's lots, lots of players. Um, I just especially like the recordings of those three, but I don't really know why. You know, I don't, I don't know why. I haven't really studied enough, studied it enough to really sort of know why. It just feels good. Their playing just feels good. Have you ever heard um, Horowitz play Scriabin as a big? Carnegie Hall concert, I think he did, where he plays. No. Like, oh, it's awesome! No. Oh, you got to check it out. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, I will. Yeah. yeah, Horowitz playing the the Scriabin Sonata Number no. Ten, which is, I don't know. Oh, do you okay. know much about Scriabin? He sort of. No, you know, I don't. No, I, mean, oh, I know he, the name. I don't 
don't know much of the music, no. He became uh, convinced that he was essentially the Messiah and was going to write this gigantic piece uh, that was synthesizing music and dance and drama and perfume wafted through the air and all kinds of things. And then wow. he, he died young in the most ridiculous way possible. He cut himself while shaving his mustache and it got infected. Uh, and he had a very wow. fancy mustache, I might add. <laughs> but he, he cut his... When, cut when his, was this? What century was this? Uh, I think he died in 1915. Now, I, I may be happy to have to de dodge a brick thrown at me by some of my historian colleagues if I get that wrong. But I want to say it was 1915. Uh, I'll quickly look it up to make sure I don't get it wrong. But yeah, he, yeah, he was sure. born in the 19th century and he died in the early part of the 20th century. I was right, 1915. Yeah. Hurry for me. Okay. I, I get to keep yeah. my job. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But, but his, uh, his tenth sonata... I, what he tried to do is he tried to unify everything. And that was part of that. That idea came through in his music too. And his 10th sonata, I think mm. is kind of the ultimate expression of that. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful, okay. wonderful piece. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Horowitz right. plays the living hell out of it. So it's great. Great. Nice. I'll check uh, that out. You mentioned uh, jazz pianists. So who, 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 who's been a big influence on you, I guess, in the past and who's well, my very son, much. My, son, my oldest son is called Oscar after Oscar Peterson, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bill Evans and Keith Jarrett, Errol Garner, um, Art Tatum, obviously, Tommy Flanagan, did I say Red Garland, um, McCoy Tyner, Herbie Hancock, but I mean, the the, the, fir the first three, Keith Jarrett, Bill Evans and Oscar Peterson are my sort of favourites. They're the ones that I've spent the most time kind of listening to and, and dissecting. And they're all so different. You know, they just sound, you can just hear like one second and you immediately, well, I do, I know immediately who who, it, who they are, you know. Um, yeah, th those three. But I, gr I grew up listening to like Little Richard and Randy Newman. You know, when I was learning to play the piano, those were the, I didn't get into jazz until my 20s, like late teens, early 20s, like playing it. So I grew up listening to sort of rock music, you know, Little Richard, he was my hero as a kid. And, uh, and Randy Newman, he was my favourite. I love his songwriting and his playing. So I learned a lot from uh, listening, listening to him. Um, yeah. Are you much of a fusion fusion fan, or or for that yeah, matter? Yeah, okay. yeah, totally. I mean, Jan Hammer. You know, if you're going to be playing, if you're going to be playing fusion music, you have to listen to Jan Hammer, obviously. And Joe Zabinol. I love Weather Report. And who are the other fusion guys? Um, those are like the sort of two two main ones. Chick Corea, obviously. I mean, mm -hmm. I love Chick Corea. Absolutely love Chick Corea. And again, he's so different. He's so so different. Chick Corea. He's mm -hmm. so he's so like even you know he's just there's something in his play when he's playing straight when he's playing latin music so when he's not swinging there's no one that sounds like him he's just he's i don't know yeah like a return the first return to forever album um i just absolutely love um he, he's great i, I love chick career you know he's he's fantastic I mean, he was originally uh, a percussionist, wasn't he? I think you can often notice things about people's playing by, if I remember correctly, yeah. I think I think he was oh, a okay. percussionist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 His, his timing is just, is so, is so, I love his timing. You know, it's so like, I don't want to say machine-like, because mm -hmm. that makes it sound sort of not hum, human, but um, it's just, it's so precise. His technique is so, so precise, you know? He was great. Do you know that record he did with Gary Burton called Crystal Silence? Yeah, I do know. Yeah, yeah. that's that's really, that, and the two of them yeah. are just at the top of their game. And uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I like, I like now he sings, now he sobs, and then, and then a later one, I forget what it's called. I think it's just called maybe Chick Corea Plays, and it's mm -hmm. like, it's a bunch of he he talks a lot. It's like a double record, and it's piano. And he plays a mixture. He plays some jazz tunes, but then goes into like classical tunes and stuff. And he gets someone else up on stage. It's like very kind of informal. And then the and then the other half of it is called. It's like he wrote I don't know thirty pieces or something for children. They're called like mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact name. But he plays these very short pieces. Some of them are like a minute and a half long. And these beautiful little, just little pieces. And some of them are quite like sarty almost. You know. Mm -hmm. um, 
ah, oh, it's great. I just love it. You know, it's just so cool. He plays like a bit, of, you know, he'll go from like Waltz for Debbie and, and then he, and then he goes into like, I don't know, some Brahms. Or something. I can't remember, but he, he, he's just improvising over um, classical and jazz tunes and stuff. It's great. I love it. Yeah, I think he has a series of, if I remember correctly, because one of them was on the Crystal Silence album and then they just call it Children's Song. But I think he ended up numbering oh, okay. them or something like that. Yeah, Ch Children's Song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree yeah. about the Sati connection. So. Yeah, yeah. What about the, the younger generation of people coming up? Do you listen at all to folks like Jacob Collier or Dummy and J.D. Beck, people like that? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I loved all Jacob Collier's first, like his video, and I love um, Pure Imagination, you know, from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and that his arrangements are incredible, and he's like, he's a savant. I mean, there's there's no there's no two ways about it. He's got as perfect as pitch can be. He's got it. You know, he can sing in like microtonal way, like perfectly. You know, and uh, I thought it was sort of amazing, but. Oh, I, I don't, I, I don't like his writing, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm being mm -hmm. honest, he's an incredible player. And when you hear him play piano, he's like the best jazz piano player. And then you hear him play bass. He's just, he's so talented and so musical, but I don't really like any of the material, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. but I like the way he does that sort of Bobby McFerrin style thing of getting the audience to sing and being the choir, you know, um, but no, it's not for me. It's, it's, it's not for me. You know, mm -hmm. um, I would love to get into some 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 new players. You know, um, if you can recommend some someone to me, I'll I'll listen. I mean, a lot of it's not jazz, but a lot of people were pretty excited about the Lemon Twigs a few years ago. I don't know if you, yeah, were... of course. I, oh, I thought you meant like jazz. Of course, I yeah, know the well, Lemon Twigs. Yeah, well, I, it also... fact, the show... yeah, yeah. No, they're great. I really like them. I describe them as a sort of weird postmodern sort of Beatles esque kind of thing. I played um, a "Prove to You" to someone. I really like that song, and I played it to someone about a week ago. You know, I hadn't listened to them for ages, but no, they're great. They're really cool. They've got a cool vibe, and you know, he looks like Keith Moon. You know, the drummer like looks like he looks like a cross between Keith Moon and Pete Townsend. Like he really does, and, and he plays like them too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they love the Beach Boys. Like the Beach Boys are my number one. The Beach Boys and Harry Nilsson and the Beatles mm. because of their harmonies, you know. Um, I, lo I love that style. And, and I hear that in their music, you know. But, mm. I, but I don't know them too well, you know. Mm. But, but, they are, but they're great. Um, uh, what I want to say is that there, there are people who are interested in music and listen to music like radio. And there are people who are interested in music. And I know from my personal uh, experience when I was young and I was into Pink Floyd and Doors and many different bands um, that I had nobody to talk to on a level uh, I wanted to talk about. You know, the specific things, things you are both are talking about right now, for example. And I even uh, had the idea of putting an ad in the paper asking for a friend <laughs> to talk about music because there were yeah, yeah. just none. Um, yeah. And, and now you being so much into music and, and, and your far, father, of course, being one of the most iconic uh, creators of music, it must have been very interesting in your household just to discuss and talk about music. Um, I'm really jealous of about that I have to <laughs> have to say uh, it's a great thing to have and um, yeah that's one of the reasons why we did the podcast to be honest to be mm. able to to talk about music on a level where many people outside of that bubble would say yeah yeah I like it <laughs> yeah 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 I mean I, yeah I like talking about music pretty much more than anything else it's the thing I, I, I know the most about so you know it's the easiest thing for me to talk about so you mentioned less uh, Claypool and He's he's a I don't even say if if you could say he's a great guy or it's a great project. But when I was young, when I was like seventeen or eighteen years old, I was a big Primes fan, and I uh, we, we talked about it, Phil and me before, because bands like Primus, No FX, but Butthole Surfers, these were the bands besides the old prog rock bands I liked yeah. when I was young, and it was such a 
it, it took many years to realize that they did this Frog uh, Brigade live animals CD. And yeah. it was unbelievable for me to, to have a, you know, a combination of these Prog Rock, Pink Floyd, the world I, I've been in, and, and then this post-punk or punk, whatever music, and then they're playing Animals Live. And yeah, I, I, to be totally honest, I don't really like cover bands uh, because I think, you know, if you get the original, why listen to a cover band? But I get, I understand it. But these were CDs I bought because I like the way he's doing it. And it's, as I, when I saw that you were playing with them together, it must be, uh, must have been wonderful because of a completely different approach to Pink yeah. Floyd, not to 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 do the same as the original you know, yeah but to have a totally different approach mm. yeah it was great you know we played it similar to the records but not i suppose it was note for note but not you know it's definitely not a cover band you know because les doesn't play anything like my old man you know um it was great i mean i love playing animals it's my favorite record to listen to and to play so That, that was really good fun to play that every night. And I got to sing dogs as well. I don't really sing that much, but I got to sing dogs. So Yeah, it's That's a wonderful, really wonderful album. Yeah. Could I, could I ask about your work for, I think my students will probably throw something at me if I don't ask about your work for Nintendo, right? Um, because I've got oh, so yeah, many yeah, students yeah. in my, my classes who are, you know, seem to live and breathe video games and... I guess I'm wondering, you know, how did that come about? And, and uh, yeah. I think I spotted yeah, a couple yeah. titles, but I'd be interested in anything you want to tell us. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge gamer. That was always a hobby and it still is. I love video games. So I'm, I'm very clued up. Um, yeah, I got that through. Uh, I didn't, I still haven't even met the guy, but a mutual friend introduced me and this guy called Hawken. Uh, he lives in Japan and uh A great guy, really, really nice guy. And he was making a game for, for Nintendo. It was published through. So it's his game. Um, I, I, I was, it was definitely published by Nintendo, but is it? An, no, it's not. It's his game, Dadako, D-A-D-A-K-O is the name of the company, but published by Nintendo. So it came out on the Switch and uh, it was it was great. And he wanted chiptune uh, music. Do you, do you know what that is? Yes, I've actually written a couple myself, yeah. Oh, okay, great. There you go. Yeah. What did you use? How did you how did you write them? Well, I'm 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 kind of a weirdo. I I like writing for very old systems. I mean, like the actual Nintendo and the Intellivision and the Atari. So, I've done some of that with the, on the programming end of things. So, but so, so what what software do you actually use to write? I, do you have? I, I actually use. I mean, I, some people who do this use what are called tracker software. So they so they you know yeah. they, they program in the loops and. I actually did some of it in um, either assembly language or or a form of assembly language. So um, oh, okay, yeah, for the yeah. Really old ones. Uh, I think trackers are pretty standard. Yeah, I started off working. I, I'd worked on another game for this guy, and I, I just did it in Cubase. And you know, because the original NES had like four channels, and had four, only had four channels. Like, can't remember which configuration, but like two sine, a triangle, and a square, or two triangles a square and a, I can't remember, I can't Something remember like that. which. I think it's two tri two yeah two two square a triangle uh, or like a fixed a fixed volume triangle it's really weird and then a PCM channel right. and a noise channel yeah 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 exactly yeah yeah exactly and then a noise channel so you can make like percussion sounds you know um but but at the beginning I sort of cheated and I was just using Cubase and I downloaded a sound pack you know But the, but the way that these guys, like Koji Kondo is one of my favorite composers of all time. I just, like the, the, the Zelda music and the Mario Brothers music, I just, he's just amazing. He's one of my absolute favorites. Um, but you have the limitations. They were doing it on, the, as I'm sure you know, but the listeners probably don't, on these like old computer screens with, you know, very little graphical interface. And they were limited by their four channels and by what they could do. So when I was using Cubase, it, it, I found myself like, oh, I, I, I would sneak in a fifth, a fifth track at some point because I wanted to, you know, and, and Hawken, he had a great ear and he said, I want it to be authentic. I don't want that. For, you know, I don't want you to cheat. So I found a thing called Famitracker, which mm -hmm. which emulated the, the, the original mess just with the four channels. And it was a nightmare it, because it goes, well, for starters, it's up, down. So it doesn't go left and right, which is what 
I mean, everything he uses, maybe DP goes up, down. I don't know. There's, you know, all sequences go left to right. You know, mm -hmm. this thing went up and down and there was no like record function. It wasn't like MIDI. You know, I didn't play anything in MIDI. I wanted to do it exactly how they had done it, set myself the same limitations. I don't know if you've used oh, it's a mosquito. Sorry, there you go. I think I got it. Um, uh, it is, you have to program it using hexadecimal. So, oh, yes. so you know, and it, <laughs> So I had to look, well, there you go. You know what that's like. So it's like, oh, my God, this is a nightmare, you know. But I'm like, I'm pretty good with computers, and I've done pro a bit of programming and for fun over the years. So, like, I got I got my head around it. But the first thing I did was copied the, the main Zelda theme. Um, you know, I downloaded a Famitracker copy. So I, it's not MIDI, but it's like the Famitracker equivalent of a MIDI file. So I could literally see it going, you know, and you've got your like one row column, I guess you should call it for what note. And then you have your effects in the other one. So you have like, you have tremolo and I think you have vibrato and decay and stuff. And you have to, well, you know what it's like, you have to program it all in. It's like such a nightmare, but that's how these guys, that's how these guys did it. That's how they put their music into the NES and the, and the Super and the snares and all, all those consoles. So that was really good fun. So the game that we ended that I ended up scoring entirely was called Pirate Pop, and it's on the Switch. You know, you can go, you can hear it, and maybe there's a bit on my website. I, I don't know, but it's like very old school, traditional chip tune music. You know, I loved it. It was really good fun, but I've never done it since. Because like, how many people are interested in chip tune music? Not many, you oh, know. Uh, I don't know if you, if you stepped into one of my classes, you might. I mean, granted, I teach it. Oh, really? School, but... Okay, sure, sure. But it's. Um, I mean, in the like, in the grand scheme of things, you know what I mean. I know a bunch of people, and you obviously know a bunch of people who are into chip tune. But it's not like, it's not like Taylor Swift, you know. It's not. <laughs> so I. So I never. I never got asked to do a, like another chip tune j job. So it's sitting on my computer, Famitrack, and I, I wouldn't remember how to use it now. I'd have to like relearn, but I really enjoyed that process. Did, did it feel a bit like, you know, the little kid in you that, oh yeah, uh, did it feel a little bit like the little kid in you who said to, you know, said to himself, someday I might write music for one of these. It's like, finally, yeah, actually getting to do it. Yeah, yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was really good. It was really good fun. Cause I grew up on Nintendo. I was like Nintendo fanboy, you know, mm. um, I never had Sega um growing up so it was always nintendo for me and um so yeah that was amazing I've got like 10 minutes left i need to be out of here at like 10 to sure. yeah okay no problem yeah uh yeah that that was a great experience really good fun mm -hmm. i love doing that one of my old teachers he once pointed out that you know there are these beautiful beautiful bach violin pieces right and when you put them on the piano they never uh they never make the same impression and the reason is that there's something yeah. exciting about hearing a composer straining against limitations. I think that, you know. Totally, yeah, yeah. It's very telling yeah, that as soon absolutely. as they began to have tools that let composers, this happened especially on the Sega end of things, they developed a bunch of tools to let composers mm. do whatever they want and the quality of the music tanked uh, because it turned yeah. out it was, yeah. it was much better to have them having to agonize over every single note. Absolutely, than... yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, can't remember who, where I learned this. You know, I've learned a bunch, look at YouTube tutorials, but um, something I teach when, when I'm teaching piano is, is to, to limit yourself. So when I'm teaching people to play uh, jazz, you know, I'll say, right, limit yourself to, to one note. So let's say you're playing, a, you know, a blues or something, you know, so you're playing... And then do three. So if you, it, it sets yourself to so limit yourself harmonically or possibly rhythmically. So only play like on the one or only play on the one and. But having that limitation, when I was like uh, listening to a lot of Oscar Peters and going, how does he play? How does he play like that? And how does he get that swing? That's that's how I 
studied Oscar Peterson was just playing, and that was just like a blues, a blues in C. You know, could you hear that, by the way? Yes, yeah, very yeah, well. We yeah. You could. Yeah. I, I suddenly thought, wow, maybe the piano didn't come through at all, and I'm just <laughs> no, sitting no, there, we can't hear anything. Um, you know, so you do one note, then two, then three, and then four. You know, and then you're like you're playing minor pentatonic, but then introduce like the blues notes if you're in C, introduce the F sharp. But it just it really it, it forces you to really feel just the, the one note. It, ma it makes it much easier, you know. And I'll often do that now when I start start soloing. Sometimes I'll just say I'm going to limit myself either harmonically or, or rhythmically, you know. Um, and it's such a great way of learning and playing is imposing limitations on yourself, you know, so, certainly to learn, you know. Um, I think it's also great for young musicians because yeah. it teaches them, you know, the older I get, the more I think that what separates the really terrific musicians from from people who kind of struggle more to people who struggle more to find an audience that hears them and go, whoa, wait a minute, you know, you, and you know that feeling you get when you hear a musician, you go, whoa, wait a minute, like there's something that's coming from them that's special. Yeah. I think that the, the musicians yeah. who don't reach that next level, a lot of the time, they don't think about articulation. Uh, it's like, the, you know, just listening to yeah. you play this now, you can hear, you know, even just playing one one note, you can hear the way yeah. that your choice of articulation is steeped in this sort yeah. of very specific dialogue, right? And yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Oscar Peterson articulated like no one else. You know, he, he'd go from like, the quietest note to a really loud one and was so syncopated you know his swing is well i'm sure his swing is just incredible you know it's just you know the learning swing was really good i mean it's great for anyone but just in particular like the, the accent on the offbeat and really learning syncopation and feeling the offbeats as opposed to the the downbeats and what i have people do is and it surprises me when people don't know this, but everyone's got to start somewhere, is putting the metronome on the two and the four. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to learn to play jazz, you, you know, one, two, three, four is fine on your metronome, but very quickly you want to be going three, four, two, three, four. You know, when I if I if I hear someone click because I spent so long playing jazz, I, I have to force myself to hear that as the one and the three. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear two, a one, two, three, four. I I have to struggle I'd have to struggle to go one, one, three, <laughs> one, two, three. You know, it's like a real effort and it feels really weird to do that. Um but um yeah so so yes it's syncopation. Why did I start talking about that? Oh, because we were talking about articulation. Do you, have any, do you have any projects going on now that you are you know, particularly excited about that you'd like to tell, yeah, tell our just, listeners about? Uh, just, yeah, yeah, I've just finished a movie, a horror movie, which was really, really good fun. I sort of leaned into sort of Bernard Herman. Bernard, is it Bernard or Bernard? I'm never sure, but Bernard Herman. Bernard, Bernard Herman. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that kind of thing, very old fashioned, lots of sort of high strings, hot horror movie. So that was really good fun. And then I've got another film... Uh, next year, which will be really exciting. It's set in Zimbabwe. Hmm. So I'm listening to a lot of uh, local Zimbabwean music and that those beats and stuff. African music is one of those things that I've never like, I've never studied, you know, uh, hmm. I've listened to a bunch of like Ali Farka Torre and I love listening to world music and uh, music from Africa and uh, all, all, all over, you know, Arabic music, but it's, I've never dived in. I don't, I don't sort of know how it all works. So I'm listening to a, a lot of it to, to be able to do that. And then I've got a documentary that I'm going to score. I don't know quite what I'm going to be doing for, with that. That'll probably just be orchestral, um, just kind of standard orchestral. Um, but I'm also about to start making a heavy metal record, which I'm really excited about. I've wanted to make a heavy metal record forever. And I've just recorded a track with, do you know the band The Residents? Yeah, yes. I do, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, you know, most people haven't heard of the residents, but I figured that you guys would have done. You know, uh, they're obviously like incredible. I've just done a track with Nolan Cook, um, like yeah. insane. It, it'll be out in February, I think. So, so listen out for it. It's like fucking insane, and it's just <laughs> brilliant. I, I'm playing B3 on it, and he's playing insane guitar. And I think we're going to make a record together. We have a mutual friend who sort of brought us together, a musician, and he's just about to float the idea that 
hey, maybe we should make a record together. So it's not it's not for definite yet. Don't quote me on that. But I'm hoping to, you know, make an insanely heavy. I don't even know what you'd call it. Not death metal, but just like fucking nuts. Something that would make record. John Zorn blush, right? It's host, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not quite John Zorn levels of madness, but sort of getting there. Yeah, that that's the kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, look forward to that. Um, That'll be cool. And then just more, more practice. You know, I'm playing the Atina Jazz Festival in the summer in Italy. So I just need to, I'm going to learn a bunch more. So I want to play with some all new tunes that I've never played before. And I've never learned, there's Inner Urge right there. And it's wrong. This These last four bars here are just, are just wrong. They've just been hmm. transcribed really poorly. So I'm trying to listen to it. But it's so, it's really hard to pick it up. Are you using uh, the real so book chart or something else? Yeah, yeah, th- yeah, yeah. I mean, this is my this is my book from it's the fifth oh, edition. So I've had the same one. Like 30, right. yeah, Thirty years or something, and it's just the court. The harmony's good, and and they're, all the notes are right up until like the final line. But that that those whole last four bars, yeah. they're just like gibberish. This guy's just gone. Uh, it's something like that, you know. The approximation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's an approximate and it's okay and they go past so quickly it's like 16th 16th note in in five so it's like it's it's like so weird you know um so i'm just having to do it by ear and it's it's hard to pick it up but there you go it's good that's a great tune i i, I was working on I pretty love- hard on a concept for that back in like 2003 yeah. 2004 and I, it was right on the edge of of getting it and then i had to go back to grad school and, and do other things yeah yeah so. yeah I mean, you, you know, harmonically, it's fine. You know, the chords are fine. I've played it like hundreds of times at jam sessions, but I've just, there's always been a horn player there. So I've never bothered learning the head, you know, ne- never bothered mm-hmm. learning the... Do you, in America, do you say the head for the yes, tune? Yes, yes, yeah. You do? Yeah, 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 fine. Yeah, I've just never learned the head. So it's really fine. And um, fuck, what's that famous George Shearing song? Conception. Conception, thank you. Conception. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm learning that as well. He he played fuck. I love George Shearing. He's amazing. Mm. You know, um, the best you know blind white piano player of all time. <laughs> it's just incredible. You know, um, so that's that's what I'm going to be doing next few days. Oh, that's cool. It sounds like you got a full plate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, always. Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you very much, Harry, for your time. Oh yeah, you're welcome. It's lovely. Yeah, you're welcome. Really great. And yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you all the listeners for listening. It's uh, been our first episode of 2024. And please do not forget to subscribe, not to miss any upcoming episodes. So thank you very much, Phil. Thank you very much, Harry, of course. And good night. Thanks for having me, guys. See ya.